it's an incredible ending to the book of Genesis. Jacob is on his deathbed and he gives a blessing to each of his sons. And at the conclusion, he gathers his feet and goes on to the land of his ancestors. And then the drama begins because Jacob does not want to be buried in Egypt. He's not an Egyptian. And he asks Joseph, please bury me in Ma'arat HaMachpelah in the double level cave that your ancestor Abraham purchased. And that's where um, Abraham and Sarah are buried and Isaac and Rebekah. And that's where I buried Leah and that's where I want to be. You know, a few weeks ago we talked about the fact that Jacob speaks to Joseph about not having buried Rachel in that tomb, and he left her outside the contiguous land of Israel, the future land of Israel, and he speaks to Joseph heart to heart about that. And that is actually a very important feature of today's reading, and that is when Jacob and Joseph finally reunited after all those years, they spoke openly about the things between them. They didn't speak about his loss and his his capture and his kidnapping by his brothers or being sold to Egypt. We presume they might have talked about that, but that wasn't the main part of the conversation. It was about Joseph and his relationship with his mother, Jacob's beloved Rachel. Now, that opens up the whole conversation. What else did Jacob and Joseph talk about? It's not very clear because the text doesn't dwell on it very much, but we did get that insight into the conversation. And Jacob is then, with permission from Pharaoh, obviously even Joseph has to seek permission from Pharaoh to leave the land and to take the elders of Egypt with him, and it's a very heavy, a very powerful expression of mourning that for 70 days the land, the people of Egypt mourned, and there was this massive cavalcade all the way up to the land of Canaan where they finally buried Jacob. It was an extraordinary story if you read it. And then comes the big moment we've been waiting for, and that is what happens to the brothers after the death of Jacob. Well, if you read the text carefully, it says... The brothers of Joseph saw that their father had died. I mean, obviously. And they realized with his death, they were vulnerable. So they said to themselves, what if Joseph hates us? What if Joseph hates us? In other words, we don't know if he hates us or not. But maybe he has the right to hate us for what we've done to him. And he will bestow upon us all the evil that we have done to him. What if? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father commanded before his death. And he said, This is what you say to Joseph. Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin towards you, because they did evil to you. But please forgive them. And that's the message they send to Joseph. And how does Joseph respond? Yosef hears the message. He probably realizes his father never said such a thing. Because had his father wanted to talk to him openly like he did about his mother, he would have said it directly. He would have said, Joseph, forgive your brothers. But this appears only after the death, only after the death of his father. And in their telling of the command of his father, it is presumed that Joseph might not be magnanimous, that Joseph might not be forgiving, that Joseph might indeed exact revenge. And Joseph had no intention of doing so. So he cries, not because of the betrayal of his father, but because of the betrayal of his brothers. And on the possibility that it did indeed come from his father, that was a betrayal too far for even Joseph to imagine. And if you listen to the response 
and that Joseph offers his brothers. So the brothers come, and they follow up this message, and they prostrate themselves in front of Joseph, and they say, we are your slaves, we are sorry. And Joseph looks at them and says, Vayomer alehem Yosef, al tirau, be not afraid. Ki, why should you not be afraid? Hatachat Elohimani, he asks a question, Am I instead of God? The Atem Chashavtem Alai Ra'a, you thought evil against me. Elohim Chashvalitova, God thought of it in a positive way. Leman Aso Kayomaze, so I can have what I have this day. Lachayot Amrav, to keep. Multitudes alive. Viata al tirau, and he says to his brothers, "Do not be afraid. Anochi achal kelatchem. I will take care of you. I will feed you, and your children." Vayinachem otam Yosef vayidaber alibam, and Joseph comforted them, and he spoke heart to heart, and he made them feel comfortable that he would not hurt them. What does happen in this little reading is Joseph acknowledges that they've done bad. But he deflects it entirely. And he says, what? Am I instead of God? You thought you were going to do me harm. And God says, it's going to turn out okay. I will take care of you. And he doesn't say, I forgive you. He doesn't say, it never happened. He doesn't say, those were those days, now is today. He says, don't worry, I will not let you down. I was put here for a reason, I will take care of you. What's really fascinating about this is that he doesn't forgive them. He doesn't even engage in the question of forgiveness. It is entirely possible Joseph never forgave his brothers. It's entirely possible that his response to their fears and their anxieties was, it's okay. It turned out okay, didn't it? That is a non-apology. That is a non-forgiveness. There is nothing in there that assuages the person who's asking for forgiveness. If you have a fight and the person says, don't worry, in the end I tripped and fell, you knocked me over, I broke my teeth, but the good news is that when I fell... I found a suitcase with money, so it's all okay now. No, that doesn't resolve the the conflict. It just resolves the outcome. Joseph is talking here at cross purposes with his brothers. They came to ask for forgiveness, and he came to tell them. He responded with, it's okay. It turned out fine. So in this conversation, it can be argued that was forgiveness. I don't feel that way. I don't feel Joseph had any reason to forgive his brothers. There was no purpose. He lived his life. He suffered. What was the purpose in forgiveness? His purpose was, My purpose in this life is to take care of other people, and I will continue doing that. You included, and your children, you have nothing to worry about. And he comforts them. Maybe he did say kind things. I don't know, but it doesn't sound like forgiveness. Now, the key phrase in this conversation is such a deeply powerful idea. It's rooted very deeply in the jealousy of the brothers to Joseph, of the challenges of Jacob in trying to manage four wives. Listen carefully. Joseph uses words that are very calculated to respond to his brothers. And here are those words. Hatachat Elohim Ani. Am I here instead of God? Where have we heard that before? Recently. We heard it with Rachel, Joseph's mother. And who said those words, Hatachat Elohim Ani? Am I here instead of God? Jacob. Listen to this. In chapter 30, Rachel sees that she bore no children to Jacob. And Rachel envied her sister Leah, who had given birth to Jacob. 
And she comes to Jacob and she says, Hava li banim, give me children. Vim ayin, and if not, me ta anochi, and if not, I'd rather die. And Jacob's response to her was in anger. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in God's stead who has withheld children from you? Is it God, am I here instead of God? Do I represent God's view of the world and I've withheld children from you? And Rachel responds to the unrespondable. Says, okay, have my handmaiden instead. So we have this moment that was probably deeply, deeply seated in the psyche of Joseph. His mother probably having told him, I'm just projecting, I'm imagining, that jo Joseph knows the story of his birth. I went to your father and I said, I want children. And he said, am I here instead of God? It may have been a deep resentment that lasted forever. Clearly, Joseph knows that phrase, and he knows those words, and he uses it as pointedly as his father did, and as Rachel felt it, he used the same barbed arrow on his brothers. He said, don't worry, it's not my decision, it's God. Jacob used it to deflect Rachel, and Joseph used it to deflect his brothers. Now, there's a deep, deep drama in this story. I need not tell you that this goes deeply into the rooted heart of love and loss and brokenness and the unspeakable and the unforgivable. And in today's Haftorah, read, thank you, uh, Larry Goldenberg, for beautiful Haftorah, we have a different end-of-life story, but also has this deep-rootedness in it. But it's very different than the story of Jacob and Joseph, which focused really around forgiveness and the brothers and trying to keep the family intact and about a commitment that Joseph not be left in Egypt when his, when his brethren leave and that his bones be taken with them, which Moses does eventually. We have the story of David on his deathbed. And when David is on his deathbed, he calls his son Solomon, who after much travail is finally established as king. David had rebellions by his own children, by his generals, by, by trusted advisors. It was terrible until finally Solomon was chosen after much bloodshed and challenge. And he calls Solomon and he says, listen, I'm going the way of all people, and you should be strong and be a man. And do what you have to do, and be a good king, and follow the laws and the statutes. But here's what I want you to do. There's a little bit of unfinished business I have. You know what Yoav, the son of Tzeruiah, did to me, and what he did to the captains of the army, Avner and Amasa, who he killed in cold blood. Be smart. Don't let him get old. Take care of him. You know what I mean. But the Barzili family, who protected me and sheltered me, they're going to eat at your table. They're going to be guests in your palace. You're going to treat them with utmost respect. But Shimi ben Gera, the Benjaminite, This, says David, I will never forget. On the day when I went to Machanayim, and David was vulnerable to Saul, and David was vulnerable in his kingdom, and Shimei hurt him. Hurt him deeply. He exploited his hurt and he made it impossible for David to forget. But David said, I won't put you to death. I will not kill you. And David said, I won't kill him. But you, you can finish the business. 
And then it goes on to talk about how David was king for 40 years, and he passes on, belongs to Solomon. And the text, exactly how Solomon took care of the business. You may want to read it in the book of Kings 1. This is chapter 2. It's a fascinating story of the politics and the inner workings and machinations of the kingdom of David and Solomon. But a very different tale at the end of David's life with unfinished business, which involved very clear instructions. Kill, forgive, support, kill. And that is the difference between the story of Genesis and the story of the Israelites. Genesis was a story of a family still trying to find itself. They were nomadic. They were sojourners. They didn't have a land. They didn't have a clear identity. They didn't have a clear set of values. They were kind of a blend of things they did like everyone else and things they didn't do like everyone else. They were a blend of values that they espoused based on monotheism and Abraham and his ideas and based on the heathen values around them and their opposition to it or their support of it. They were wealthy. They were shepherds. They, they had their own engagement with the world. They weren't part of the tribes of the land. But by the time we deal with David... And by the time we find ourselves in the land of Israel, with a kingdom, with a throne, with an established hierarchy, the people of Israel had become an empire. And the empire has a whole different worldview. It's not about family anymore. It's about power. It's about authority. It's about defining the reign of the king and the authority granted by God. And that is why David's life ends as a warrior, just as it began, with the slaying of Goliath. David ends his life with bloodshed. Jacob ends his life with blessings for his children, despite the fact that they were, some of them were harsh and telling. Joseph ends his life with integrity, with an effort to do what his task was. And Joseph never forgot the fact that despite all the hardship, it turned out well. And because it turned out well, his responsibility was to make it turn out well for others. And he does. And friends, it is deep, deep winter and deep COVID time and time to stay home. It's a time for us to reflect on our families. It's a time for us to reflect on the power we thought we had and we don't. It's a time for us to consider what good has come out of the bad. What have we been put here for if not for a perfect life how to make other lives better and thereby live our mandate and our purpose despite the fact that our empires have crumbled. Friends, we will go back to something. We will go back to rebuilding our castles, to rebuilding our power, our empires, our comfort level, our purpose and goal and role in this world. We will go back there. But now is an opportunity to ask, despite all the hardship, what am I here for? And if you know that, you'll know your purpose. I wish you well in the days to come. Stay safe, stay healthy. Shabbat shalom.